So I'm Bill Davison. I'm a tree crop commercialization lead for the Savannah Institute. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about SI. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization and we work with um, farmers, scientists, and consumers to uh, lay the foundation for widespread agroforestry in the Midwest. And our goal is to catalyze the adoption of resilient and scalable agroforestry. You can learn more about us on our website. There's a lot of resources there and also um, our event section lists uh, upcoming programs. And this webinar is made possible by the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Department of Agriculture and the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program. So we're grateful to them for their support. And uh, it looks like um, a lot of people already know Jim, but Jim Riddle is our speaker for today. And we're fortunate to have Jim here to share his insights with us. Um, Jim's had a long and distinguished career in organic agriculture. He's been farming and gardening and working as a policy analyst speaker um, and an, or, an avid organic eater for 35 years now. Um, and he co-owns and operates Blue Fruit Farm in Southeast Minnesota. Um, and this is where he and his wife grow blueberries, black currants, elderberries, aronia berries, and more. And he's going to share his um, experiences with us. So uh, please uh, try to keep yourself muted uh, during the presentation. And then the way we like to manage this is um, if you could type your questions into the chat um, as we go along, um, we will answer those at the end of the presentation. So I think we're ready to get started now. So Jim, if you'd like to share your screen, you can take it from here. Okay, uh, thanks Bill. And uh, thanks Savannah Institute for organizing this and inviting me to speak. I'm not seeing what I want of my screen. Uh, just give me a moment here. Got it. Okay, it now. Can I try actually going to this? All right, here we go. Thanks for your patience. Um, so yeah, gonna talk about our farm and let's see, well, if it's not properly advancing that way, it's very slow. So yes, my wife, Joyce and Ford and I uh, own a Blue Fruit Farm in Southeast Minnesota. It's about a five acre uh, field on a ridge top uh, near Winona, Minnesota. And it's a field that has been, the land has been farmed organically since the mid 1970s. We used to grow organic vegetables there for a number of years in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but then we got focused on inspecting organic farms and training inspectors, rented it out to Featherstone Farms, but then he pulled out and left this five acre field with a eight foot high deer fence around it. And Joyce said in 2008 or so, let's grow blueberries. And I'm like, okay, I'm game, but we need to understand that blueberries don't like our soil because we have a natural pH around 6.8 to seven, a dolomitic soils. And I also wanted to grow other things that liked our soils the way it, way it is. Uh, so that's where we came up with black currants, elderberries, honeyberries, et cetera. Um, so here's what we grow, aronia berries, um, black currants, blueberries, elderberries, honeyberries. You see June berries with a strike through them, and I'll talk about them. Um, we actually have now pulled them up as of just last fall. Uh, plums, and then various native prairie plants. And, um, you know, why did we want to get into perennial fruits? Well, after so many years of having done annuals, what we saw is with the changing um, weather, extreme weather events, uh, much more problematic to be uh, doing the tillage and all the planting it takes. The timing is critical uh, when doing annuals. So we wanted to focus on perennials, uh, where once you get them established, there's not much tillage and you aren't causing any erosion. But they're also 
uh, products that are very healthy. So high in antioxidants, high in flavor, high in vitamin C, even uh, some have antiviral properties such as the elderberries um, and a lot of market potential. Um, blueberries, I like to say, are hard to grow, but they sell themselves. The other things are easier to grow, but we have to sell them. Um, so we've been developing markets. So there's challenges, not a lot of information out there on some of these crops, um, but it's fun. It's, it's really fun to share what we're doing with other people and uh, um, to watch people's faces when they try new flavors like aronia or honeyberry or black currant. So some of the things to consider uh, when you're looking at putting in perennials is direct sun. I mean, some of these crops are, you know, plants evolved in kind of forest margins and they'll survive in some shade, but they really thrive in direct sun. So even you'll see elderberries on a wood's edge, but they'll do a lot better when they have uh, full sun. But also really important to have good airflow. So you don't wanna be tucked into a closed valley where there's just a lot of either frost or kind of moist, humid air that just hangs. So you want good airflow and that's really important for helping prevent disease problems. Uh, access to water. Um, we did uh, build a, uh, a machine shed in the middle of the field and we installed 6,000 gallons of water storage. So we capture the water from that shed and bank that and, and have uh, irrigation lines to all of our rows. And so we can water. And then when we run out of rainwater, we have a line coming up from our well so we can uh, uh, irrigate. And that's really critical when you're establishing the plants and then uh, for blueberries when they're setting fruit. Um, um, but it's a big investment. You wanna make sure that you get those plants off to a good start. Proper soil pH, um, yeah, that's really important, as well as just building the organic matter levels of the soil. Um, protection from pests. I mentioned that eight foot high deer fence. We have very high deer populations. We wouldn't be able to do anything if we couldn't prevent the deer from getting in. And then there's a, a fence about eight inches off the ground, electric wire. Uh, and we also do trapping um, for removal of raccoons and I'll get into birds and other pests, but you have to plan um, what's your strategy to protect these valuable tasty crops from pests. And uh, they're pollinator friendly um, and most everything we grow is not well pollinated by honeybees. The plums would be the only thing that, uh, so you really need to think about, do you have good populations of bumblebees, other uh, native bees uh, to pollinate these fruits? And then are you close enough to an urban area where it makes sense to do a you pick or are you gonna pick it all yourself, hire crews? Um, Cause there's a lot of hand labor involved. So it's just a strategic decision. Do you wanna manage fruit? and people or just fruit. Um, once you get into UPIC, you know, you've got to have the insurance, you've got to have restrooms, places for people to wash their hands. You got to schedule and deal with a lot of people. Um, so it's, it's a different type of operation, just some things you really need to think through. So I mentioned some of the challenges, um, deer, birds, and the primary birds we've had problems with are uh, robins. I like to say I used to like robins. Now I like how they taste. I don't really eat them, but um, they've just, they're big. They eat a lot and they have a lot of friends, uh, but also cedar wax wings. You, I really rarely seen them in my life until we planted fruit and they're a fruit eating flock bird. So when they come, there's at least 20, 40, 50 of them. And all they do is eat, eat fruit. Um, they can eat a lot in a short amount of time. Um, but also rabbits are a problem, both rabbits and mice, um, for those young tender plants. They'll nip them off, they'll chew on the bark, so you need to be able to protect with, with hardware cloth or tree tubes or netting of some type. 
And raccoons are relent relentless. Um, they just keep coming and they, 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 they do a lot of gossiping because they tell their friends and then they bring more family members. Um, so you really need to anticipate and have a plan for dealing with uh, raccoons. Um, water, uh, like I mentioned, both for uh, the establishment and then fruit set. And we do some fertigation where we inject a mixture of fish emulsion and liquid kelp into the irrigation lines at certain times of year, uh, in particular in fruit set for blueberries. Proper pruning, and that's, that's a big thing. Um, and the different crops we grow have different pruning needs, different regimens. And I'll talk about that as I talk about the individual uh, fruits. But keep in mind, it's a long-term investment. You've got to be able to float the operation for three to five years at least before you really start to get a return. You're putting a lot of money into that planting stock and into the labor, the weed control before you're harvesting and then selling any fruit in a sufficient quantity to start paying you back. So do it. We did it over, took that five acres, divided it into three sections and did it over three year time, the actual planting. So that way we could do cover cropping and really get the soil, get the weeds under control, but also we weren't getting in over our head. Um, and ironically, or maybe it makes sense that some of the plants we put in that third year have done better than the ones we put in the first year because we had taken more time to build the soil health, build up the fertility and get the weeds under better control, um, primarily through cover cropping in those uh, two years. And there's a lot of hand labor. You just uh, uh, have to understand that. Uh, weed control, harvesting, um, uh, monitoring, pruning, uh, it's just a lot of hand labor stretched out over the years. And what kind of insect pests are these fruits going to attract and how are you going to manage them? And when we first started planting, it was before spotted wing Drosophila had even been identified in Minnesota. Um, we have it, it's present, but thus far, it's not really harmed any of our production. It's not been an economical threshold. Um, and I think part of it is because we have a variety of different crops. We have a lot of native predators, a lot of biodiversity uh, uh, where we're, our farm is located. And diseases, I, we didn't know uh, various diseases that would affect black currants or elderberries, uh, but there are some. And I'll talk about those as we go along. And just general lack of knowledge about some of these crops and a lack of markets for them. So one of the challenges you need to be to you know, accept is you're gonna need to hold field days, do tastings, educate people, educate your restaurants, the chefs, the produce managers at, at uh, grocery stores and food co-ops and just the general public on what a black currant tastes like and what you can do with it. Um, there's a, a lack of knowledge out there. Okay, gonna talk about blueberries. Start off with them. Um, they're native to North America and there are a number of different varieties. So in the North, you wanna make sure you're getting Northern varieties because there are Southern varieties that do well in Georgia or Florida, but not in Minnesota or Wisconsin. And then high bush versus low bush. I'm a tall guy over six foot. And one of my criteria, I didn't want to harvest anything that was shorter than my knees. I wanted to at least have things that were waist high or higher. Um, so we didn't go into strawberries, for instance. And then my wife didn't want anything with thorns. So that ruled out a number of interesting fruits as well. Um, but you, you, there are low bush varieties uh, that are northern varieties, but we went with high bush northern varieties. And then there are early season, mid season and late season varieties. Um, we foolishly have all three. So we will be harvesting blueberries 
from early July into mid-August, so about six week period. But we, if we focused only on the early season varieties, they would be done in about two or three weeks. So by mid to late July, we would be done with our blueberry season if we just focused on the early or mid. And that's really something to look at. Each variety description in a catalog is going to tell you whether they're early, mid or late season. And if you're doing a U pick and you wanna stretch things out for a six week harvest season, then do some of each. But if you're, you know, want to target the early harvest or the late harvest, um, focus on that. But you do need to then choose, you know, all the varieties in your mix that are in that category. And the fruit size and flavor vary quite a bit between different blueberry varieties. Some are medium to small, but have really rich, intense flavors. Some and it, it kind of the bigger size often have the milder flavor in our experience. Uh, but one thing I should note um, is that uh, we consistently have people tell us that our blueberries are the best they've ever had. And they say, we even buy certified organic blueberries and yours are so much better. Why is that? Well, a lot of the organic blueberries that are now on the market, brand names like Driscoll's, those are not grown in soil. They're grown hydroponically in big pots of sterilized coconut fiber and just given a nutrient solution. And some renegade certifiers are approving that and it's undermining the whole market and making people think that blueberries don't have any flavor. But if they're grown real organic in soil, in uh, uh, healthy, vibrant, living soil, they're gonna have much more complex flavors, much more flavor to begin with. So like I said, blueberries need a low soil pH of around five to 5.5. And we have lowered our pH. We grew cover crops. We incorporated a lot of composted uh, horse manure, uh, but also added peat moss at planting. And then annually, twice a year, do pH testing in the same areas of the field um, and um, uh, top dress with elemental sulfur, which mixes with rainwater or snow melt and makes a mild sulfurous acid that helps maintain a lower soil pH. And that's approved for organic use. So that's why I said blueberries um, uh, don't really like our soil until we you know, go to great lengths to uh, uh, get that pH down. And then in general terms, kind of the more varieties you have, the better yield, um, they don't need a cross-pollinator like honeyberries do, but still the bees move from uh, variety to variety uh, and they're primarily uh, uh, pollinated by bumblebees. So if you don't have native bumblebees, you actually can purchase um, uh, hives of bumblebees, which is a much better move than having honeybees on your uh, blueberry farm. Some th things to think about. Blueberries are shallow rooted, so you want to minimize disturbance or compaction right around the plants. They're best pollinated by bumblebees or other native bees. There's not a lot of pruning you need to do, some general shaping for the first five to seven years, but after that, you really are removing kind of stemmy, dry looking uh, um, canes. And um, we always remove things that are kind of going lateral where the fruit would. Uh, be close to the ground, um, um, and also just things, branches that cross one another, allowing for good sunlight penetration and airflow. Um, we really haven't been successful in propagating blueberries, so uh, if you're going to try and do that, you got to do your research and know what you're doing. They benefit from irrigation and feeding, especially during fruit set. And like I said, you do need to protect them from deer, birds, raccoons, mice and rabbits. Um, but hand weeding, yeah, weed control is really critical. Uh, we do a lot of hand weeding. That's uh, with a uh, cobra head hoe and then uh, you know, actually hands and knees hand weeding right around the plants. We've done a number of different mulches. Um, we tried paper mulch 
when we first put them in, weeds grew right up through it. It was a waste of time and money and a whole lot of frustration. We do have some of our blueberries on a uh, uh, landscape fabric mulch and others now where we have worked in several generations of either pine straw or ground up hardwood bark mulch and now are doing some management with a mechanical weeder called a Wilsey weeder that mounts on the back of a, our tractor. A person rides on it and a spinning disc is controlled to go in and out between the plants. And then we're doing cover cropping between weeding. So um, in the summer, we'll have a regimen of low growing cover crops like annual ryegrass, white Dutch clover, turnips um, to keep the ground covered, but try and suppress some of the weeds. And then uh, uh, may come back through with the weeder one more time. You wanna make sure that the plants are planted with the root crown at the soil surface level. If you bury it, you're gonna stunt the plant for life. So just like an apple tree, you wanna get it planted at the right level um, below where it was grafted. Same with a blueberry, that crown needs to be right at the soil surface. And then even though you got the pH right for planting, you need to keep monitoring that, keep monitoring what kind of pests or any disease issues that you're having. So keeping an eye on what's happening. Now, bigger growers do mechanically harvest blueberries um, and they grow varieties that are bred specifically for mechanical harvest that don't bruise easily and maybe have less flavor. Um, but one thing we've found is that we let our fruit ripen uh, fully but then cool right away. We, we couldn't do this without a walk-in cooler. It's only six foot by eight foot, but it's, and it has shelves so we can put a lot of fruit in there, but it's really important to get the fruit down. It preserves the quality, the, the temperature down, but also if there are eggs of spotted winged Drosophila that have been, they're laid in the female while the fruit is still green. So you don't know that. And, and they, make the fruit get really soft because the larvae are inside there eating it. Um, but if it has eggs and you get it cooled down, if it's held at 35 degrees Fahrenheit or in that range, it actually kills the eggs of the spotted wing Drosophila. Um, and you'd never know they were in there uh, when you eat it. Um, if fruit are, are soft, of course, we, we do toss those out. It's very rare that we'll find a plant that does have um, enough spotted wing drosophila. And another part of our control is very thorough fruit harvest. I think if we were letting fruit drop on the ground, it would be more likely to uh, provide uh, harborage or food source for both spotted wing drosophila and other pests. And then blueberries are good for eating fresh or processing, make great uh, jams, et cetera, pies and they do have beautiful fall foliage. So this was our first plantings. We, uh, and this is actually a paper mulch and we laid the irrigation line and put this ground up hardwood bark on top of that. But that paper just disintegrated. Yeah, here it is. Um, as you can see the cover crop that we had done of, of uh, uh, various clovers there that had been under some grain that we harvested. Uh, to prep the field. That's actually a small aronia bush in the foreground. And here are the blueberries after their first year of establishment. So we were mowing uh, between the rows. And at that time we had a Mill Creek, um, uh, it's a compost or mulch spreader. So, because we had a lot of rows that we were spreading mulch on. I've since sold the machine because we really uh, don't need it. It's very heavy. And it, I, I was concerned that a lot of times a year we needed to get in there. It was really too wet to be driving close to the root zone. Um, uh, so we don't have that, but it was very helpful for the establishment. And here the mulch um, on the soil level is actually that 20 year landscape fabric um, that uh, um, we're, we're removing from some rows every year. 
uh, now, particularly in the elderberries, I'm finding that it's suppressing some of the sprouting of spontaneous elderberries that I'd like to see. So here's some blueberries, not quite ripe yet, but getting close. And there's some of that fall foliage I talked about. And uh, yeah, more uh, uh, blueberry bushes, these would be. And this was another thing we learned that I'd like to share. A lot of our planting stock was just one year old bare root stock. We went low ball, you know, we tried to save money. Some of it, we bought potted three year old plants. I wish we would have done that for everything. Yeah, they cost about twice as much at the front end, but those three, those one year old bare root have taken years to really catch up to the ones that were bigger and had more, more well-developed roots uh, when they were planted. So we, we definitely lost some production years uh, by uh, uh, going with that one year old bare root stock at the front end. So I tell people now, Plant the biggest, best blueberry plants you can afford, um, that you can find. And Backyard Berries in Indiana is a certified organic uh, nursery that has some nice varieties. So, okay, there, okay. And um, we also took part in some research projects, University of Minnesota, uh, looking at uh, spotted wing drosophila and uh, how they uh, acted uh, when there was exposed mulch versus um, uh, 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 fiber, you know, either wood, wood shavings or, or not uh, uh, ground bark is what we were using. And then also Minnesota Department of Ag was looking for a blueberry pest, but luckily did not find it on our farm. And here's just a picture. We did this is not at our farm, but just to show that there are mechanical harvesters but here's our harvesters and it varies. We hire high school kids, some college students and some teachers who are looking for work in the summer. And it's always a challenge to put together the harvest crew, but people have a lot of fun and uh, uh, we harvest a lot of wonderful fruit. Um, so here's how we sell a lot of blueberries in five pound boxes, a uh, peek inside the, uh, root cellar, you see elderberries, plums, uh, aronia berries, a number of different fruit uh, coming in and going out to buyers. And uh, okay, we'll shift gears to um, black currants. We don't grow any red currants or white currants, partly because of the name Blue Fruit Farm. We wanted to stay in the blue range. So we got black currants, which, um, and there are quite a few different name varieties. Um, we primarily are growing titania. It's kind of a workhorse of our black currants. We also have uh, a variety called Crusader, which is an older variety, very strong flavor, uh, kind of the, uh, and blue, or black currants have kind of a smoky, musky, um, Cabernet, a very intense flavor. And we have one other variety called uh, Menage Smiru, which is the earliest and has the mildest flavor. But those are the three varieties uh, of black currants that we're growing. They're all a European, uh, Ribes nigrum. Uh, there are native uh, black currants, but they really haven't been commercialized. But clove currant would be the closest of the native uh, uh, Ribes americanum uh, uh, type. But we have not, I have no experience growing them. But they're very high in vitamin C, four times the vitamin C of citrus. And hence, they're quite tart, that ascorbic acid. You don't just eat handfuls of black currants raw, at least most people don't, um, like you do a blueberry. They really need processing, but they are just make great juice, jelly, wine, sauces. We have a number of breweries that buy black currants from us uh, for various types of beer. But if you've ever purchased and eaten dried currants. Um, and that's how they're sold, dried currants. Those are not a currant. Those are grapes. They're a Corinth grape. And it should be illegal to call them currants because a lot of people think they've tasted currants and then they taste ours. It's like, oh, that's nothing like. That's because those weren't currants. Those, um, it's misleading. Uh, so anyway, be aware of that. 
what you find at the food co-op called dried currants are really just a small raisin. Um, the black currants are easy to harvest and they're very easy to propagate. You take stem cuttings and you can make new plants this time of year very easily. Um, and they, you know, they're very prominent. I'll show pictures uh, so you can find them uh, on the vine. You don't have to look for them. Or, and they're self-fertile. So even if only variety we had was Titania, that'd be fine. They don't need a cross-pollinator, but they do need a lot of pruning. We remove about two thirds of the canes from each bush every year. So you're removing anything that's four years old and leaving stuff that's one, two, and three years old in the mix. And you learn to tell the difference between the different ages, the color, the size, and then uh, when they get four years old, they get quite gnarly. And those are the ones you wanna get out of there. There are some disease issues and I'll talk about those. So here's uh, some of the titania, just with green fruit on them. And we always prune to keep things as upright as we can. So we remove laterals. So you see all of those, those are called strigs of black currants. So they're kind of like a loose grape cluster. And most of those are ripe and ready to harvest. So you just kind of go da -da 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 down the line, uh, plucking them off into a harvest container. So here's another picture of uh, the black currants um, ready to harvest. Now here is something we were shocked when we uh, uh, discovered this. It's powdery mildew. When we originally planted black currants, we planted half titania and half another variety called consort all of the consort, about 150 plants, just were lousy with powdery mildew. None of the titania had powdery mildew. And so we removed all of those titania and replaced them with, I mean, of consorts and replaced them with titania because I didn't want to fight this level of powdery mildew infestation year after year when I knew that there was a resistant variety that was a good producer because uh, we had it in the row next door. So here's what the black currants looked like uh, late winter. You can see how dense each of the bushes is. And then, um, oops, so we skipped, there we are. So here's what they look like after they've been pruned. And so we're out there pruning typically in March. Uh, once the snow is low enough, to be able to get down to the ground level because you cut them off right at the ground and then pile up the canes you've removed. And then we chip those up, mix them with horse bedding and uh, grass clippings to make a very high quality compost. But you can see how thinned out that bush is after uh, we've gone through it pruning. One of the things to watch out for, there is a current stem borer um, that will impact, especially the older canes and the pith should be a whitish green. When there's a stem borer, you get a brown black. And um, what we do, it's a lepidopteran. So it's a moth caterpillar. It's susceptible to BT or dipel, a bacillus thuringiensis. So after we're done pruning, we go back down the rows with a sprayer and spray the stumps of everything we've cut with dipel and then keep an eye uh, out during the year and you can see plants, they just kind of wilt and you'll cut them off and you'll see that black pith. And then we'll just use a little hand spray bottle and spray the stump just in case that larva is down for, on the downside of the cut. So that's just something to watch out for uh, with um, the black currants. Okay, elderberries. Um, they're pretty easy to grow and prop. They, you can make cuttings just like you do with the uh, black currants to propagate your own. There's much more awareness. People are becoming much more familiar with the health benefits of elderberries. All the ones that we're growing are Sambucas canadensis. They're native to North America and they have medicinal properties, both the flowers and the berries, and there is a market for the flowers. We haven't gotten into that. And we focused on the berries and making juice. 
There are quite a few different named varieties, and I'll talk about some of our favorites. There are some pest and disease issues. I'll talk about those. You do need to protect them from birds. Birds will come right, you know, when the um, berries are ripe and just strip them off of the syme. Then once again, they're a product you don't just sit around and eat. They need some processing. And you do need to be careful to de-stem them because the leaves and stems do have very low level of a cyanide forming compound, but that is deactivated with heating. Uh, so if you're cooking them, you're gonna get rid of that. So if there are little bits of stem in there and you're making a juice or jam or something, it's nothing to worry about. So here's a variety, our favorite called Bob Gordon. They're upright. They have a nice size cluster and they, um, we've had very few uh, disease or pest issues with this variety. Um, and here's a, a closer picture of the uh, flowers. They, I, they, and I love the smell of walking uh, through the elderberries when they're in blossom. This is another variety we grow called ranch. Ranch is much more bushy. It's not as upright. The clusters are smaller and not as uniform in ripening. So it'll, and uh, we've had more problems with uh, powdery mildew um, and a mite uh, in the ranch than we have in the Bob Gordon. But it's nice because the ranch is earlier. So you'll start to get some elderberries coming in from this variety or earlier than any of the others we grow. Um, this is a, kind of a standard called Adams. We don't have many of these plants. And once again, we've had some problems with uh, a powdery mildew in the Adams uh, variety on our farm. Um, but you see up to 15 inches, uh, the uh, syme, the cluster. Uh, so that's a lot of, lot of berries, a lot of fruit um, on that. This is a variety uh, called Nova, and they're not very productive, but they have huge berries. And one thing I do like about them is they hang down. So instead of being upright and open to birds, uh, they, they do droop, but they're not near as uh, vigorous or productive, but they have very large individual fruits. <coughs> so here I am um, in, either late February, early March, making cuttings of elderberries from stems that I, and we, we prune our elderberries by cutting them all the way back to the ground, um, either in the fall or if we're wanting to save some for either making new plants or selling cuttings, we'll cut them in February. Um, so you can see uh, that the little pieces of stem, you want two growing nodes, I like to cut the bottom of the stem at, a, at an angle and then the top uh, straight across at 90 degree. That way I know up from down. And then you put them in a mixture of peat moss and vermiculite that's wet and cover it over with a plastic sheet, allow some ventilation and magically they just start to sprout. They develop roots and you'll get new uh, elderberry plants that then I, we would individually pot in one gallon pots and then uh, wait till after frost because they are sensitive when they're that young and then uh, plant them out. Now here I am with a uh, elderberry destemmer. It's actually a prototype uh, that was developed by a friend of ours, Mike Medesim uh, in Coon Valley. He now sells four foot long models with um, uh, electric motors. This one at the time was hand crank, but then I hooked it up to a stationary bicycle. So it was probably the nation's only pedal powered elderberry destemmer. But you put the cluster in at the top, there's a stainless steel hardware cloth screen, the cylinder rotates, the stem gets pushed out the end while the berries are getting brushed off and falling into the tray down below. And it works really good. Uh, it's very simple, um, easy to clean up. Um, and, and, uh, but you have to have a plan for destemming your elderberries. Uh, so uh, Mike Badesim, uh, not Badesim, Mike Breckel, Mike Breckel, uh, Coon Valley, Wisconsin, invented that. Uh, the aronia berry. I learned about that by going to a workshop in Wisconsin, actually. 
Um, and uh, they're also native to North America, although the variety we grow called Viking was bred in Sweden uh, from uh, North American stock. And they, one thing that's nice about Aronia berries, and the common name for them is the black chokeberry, not choke cherry, but chokeberry, is they pretty much ripen all at once. A cluster is of like 20 fruit and they're all uh, ripe and ready so you can harvest. And there are mechanical harvesters. There's some big plantings in Iowa, Nebraska, and they're being mechanically harvested. The fruit, when it's ripe, holds well on the bush or once you've harvested in cold storage very well. Uh, so you got more of a window uh, to move the fruit than you do with black currants or e even blueberries. Um, and you can make stem cuttings just like I showed with elderberries or black currants. You can do that with aronia to propagate your own. They have much higher levels of antioxidants than blueberries, four to 10 times the amount. They're very hardy, drought, and they tolerate a range of pH, soil pHs. But once again, they're quite astringent, which is why they're called chokeberry. Uh, uh, so they make your mouth feel dry uh, when you chew them, even though they're wet and juicy. So they do need some processing, um, but they make incredible jellies, juices mixed in with other fruits to make wine, beer. Uh, um, so they have a lot of use. So here they are in flower. They're actually uh, in the rosaceae, in the apple uh, family. So you see these look like miniature apple blossoms. Um, and here's a close up uh, of actually a fly uh, working them. And here's the bush. This is just a three year old bush, uh, you know, from just a stem. Uh, so you can see they grow fast and they're going to start producing some fruit in three years uh, from planting. Uh, but you can see what I meant about the clusters and you can see they look like miniature little apples. Um, and yeah, you just pull that all those off, uh, uh, kind of roll them into your hand and they do uh, stain your hand a little bit, but it washes right off. Uh, but uh, they're, they're a lot of fun to pick, uh, really. You, they add up quickly, and, uh, but they do need some processing here. We were using a, uh, a steam juicer. Um, now we have a bladder press juicer uh, that we use and run them through a grinder that you, the same as what you'd use for making apple cider and then press them that way. Uh, but we do sell like uh, aronia juice or a mixture of elderberry and aronia that we call elderonia. Uh, which is very popular. Uh, honeyberry, this was probably the last fruit that we added to our collection. Didn't even know about it when we started Blue Fruit Farm. Um, but they're also known as hascaps or blue honeysuckles. They're not native to North America, but they're very similar to a plant that is the mountain fly honeysuckle. And they're called honey, not because they're so sweet as honey, but because they're in the honeysuckle genus. So Lana Sarah, um, quite a few different name varieties, Aurora, Borealis, uh, Tundra, uh, um, Cinderella, Beauty. Uh, those are some of the ones that we have. One thing I like about them is they ripen very early, like June 1st. They ripen before strawberries in the upper Midwest. And uh, you can fresh eat them. You can put them on your cereal. They're incredible in muffins, scones, things like that. Um, they have a zing to the flavor, a little bit of tartness, but they're quite palatable. They're not you know, nearly as strong flavored as black currants or aronia. Uh, so, but they are great for processing, make some uh, award-winning jams uh, from honeyberries. They're very hardy to zone two. They've been grown for many years, centuries, in Siberia, in Hokkaido, the North Island of Japan. Um, and they're known as the fruit of long life. They actually have the highest level of antioxidants of anything we grow. They do need cross-pollination. So you need at least two varieties that flower at the same time. So you want early season pear 
or mid-season pear, and there are later uh, varieties. Uh, so you have to match them up. Uh, and so uh, we get a lot of stock have from honeyberryusa.com, and they tell what varieties go well with what in their descriptions. And the birds do like them. But the one really nice thing is because they ripen so early, there's no issue with spotted wing drosophila. They haven't shown up or emerged yet when the honeyberries are ripening. So here's a young bush. This is in its first year of uh, planting. It would, those would have been a potted plant. Um, and here they are in flower, fairly large flowers, but they're always in pairs. Um, and they start blooming in mid-April, mid-April, mid to late April in Minnesota. So they can get not just a frost, but actually temperatures in the 20s when they're blooming and it doesn't hurt them. They're from Siberia. They, they can handle it. It's amazing. They're fairly showy uh, flowers. They uh, hang down and, uh, and then here's what the fruit looks like. Um, and I don't know exactly which variety is which in the different pictures. Some of them are bell shaped and some are more finger or conical. Um, and here's some data. Um, in 2018, we had harvested 186 pounds from 52 plants. They're about five-year-old plants. So we were getting about 3.6 pounds per plant on those five-year-olds. The potential yield is six to eight pounds per plant. And, uh, and we were with what we sold and we sell our honeyberries at $10 a pound. So we're getting top dollar for them, but we have more people wanting to buy them than we've, than we've harvested so far. So we haven't flooded the market yet. But each one of those bushes in that year was bringing in $31.64. Um, in 2020, we got better yield. The plants were getting older, 6.9 pounds. So we're getting right up there in that uh, potential yield range. Very pleased with that. Um, and in 2021, um, the yield went down. And uh, um, main reason was we hit a really dry spell right when they were setting fruit and we weren't on top of it and didn't put the irrigation to them early enough. And I think a lot of fruit just kind of dried up and, and didn't mature. But still, the plants were bringing in $42.50 per plant. So I mentioned, oh, there's a slide that's giving me trouble, not coming up, come on. Ah, yeah, I just wanted to uh, give a few pruning basics before I get into uh, why we don't have June berries anymore. Um, you have to make sure and prune your plants when they're dormant. You can do some uh, summer pruning just to clean things up. But for in general, you prune when dormant. And young plants is really important to kind of shape them, especially to avoid branches that are crossing or are going to cross. Um, and I always like to think, how do I, I think like the sun, how do I penetrate? How does every branch, every leaf get sunlight on it? And so pruning to maximize sunlight penetration and airflow, that's going to help prevent diseases and give you a really healthy plant and the best flavor of the fruit. And then we tend to remove low hanging and lateral branches too. Um, they have more pest problems. They're in the way of the mower and uh, harder to harvest. So my slides aren't advancing quite like they should. Try again here. Huh. Juneberry, also known as the service berry or Saskatoon. There are both tree and bush varieties. They're early blooming. Pollinators love them. The fruit has a pretty prominent seed and it's high in protein because of that. They are very sweet with a mild flavor, but they're a bird magnet. And that we just, we ended up, we only had two rows, about 40 bushes, and they were causing so much bird pressure that then would spill over to the blueberries that we had decided to remove the Juneberries from our mix 
they were kind of a hassle. It wasn't enough to, it, there's a good market for the fruit. I will say that. Um, but uh, we made a strategic decision to remove them. And here they are in bloom uh, and uh, pretty showy. Um, they kind of smell though, like rotting meat. They're not a fragrant uh, smell. And the fruit goes from green to red to black when they're fully ripe. Um, and the variety we had was Regent and it, it, it's not the best variety. I've heard that Smoky and Thiessen are much bigger and more productive fruits. So if you're thinking about them, uh, protect them from the birds and don't grow Regent, grow one of those other varieties. Hmm. Okay. We, so some of the things we've done to try and deter birds, uh, we have a sound device called a bird guard and it has four speakers. It points out over the whole field. And then there's various chips that uh, slide in and out here. The ones we have are for vineyards in the Midwest to deter um, robins and uh, um, cedar waxwings. And what they have is nine different calls, a mixture of predator calls like sharp shinned hawks and then Robins being tortured or distressed calls. So alarm calls of the target birds and they uh, uh, randomly play these various calls and it helps. But so here's one of the weatherproof speakers that are mounted on the outside of the machine shed. But it didn't do, didn't do the job. So we finally, and this isn't our field, this is just an example of uh, netting. So I don't have an overhead shot of ours but we put in what's called a smart net system. So we have guy wires and uh, put this netting over the top and then side curtains, but it's nine feet. It's quite a project, you know, takes, we have two different sides of the field that are netted. It takes a crew, a good two days, four people about two days to get the netting in place another day in the fall to retract it, and then we wrap it up and store it. And we've gotten, I'm not sure, at least six years out of this netting, uh, but it's just a matter of time before it'll need to be totally replaced. We have now installed a laser system um, to help control the birds. Uh, so uh, we'll talk more about that um, as, as we go. Uh, so we do also have some plum trees, both some blue plums and uh, uh, red plums. We do have issues with plum cucurlio. We do trapping, we planted garlic, we spray with neem and garlic spray. We also have brown rot issues uh, and some wind damage issues. Uh, the plums have been an interesting experiment, but um, they're a lot of work to really get a crop but we have a brewery that wants to buy all the plums we can grow. Uh, but uh, so some things important is when you're planting a plum tree to prune the roots, it's better to cut them off than to have them wrapped up in a circle and to uh, get that um, graft point above the soil level. Here's the tether traps we use to try and monitor plum cucurlio. They'll climb up into a little cone at the top and uh, um, that's what they look like. They have a little snout, they're a weevil. So they're um, a challenge to uh, um, see here. I'd put spread a uh, sheet under the trees and tried knocking them off with a stick. And uh, that, was, that was a failure. So don't think you're gonna do that. Um, but we've gotten some good harvests at times and uh, some nice red plums, a mixture of some blue plums and um, we do quite a bit of uh, processing in addition to selling uh, just raw fruit and frozen fruit. We make various jams and juices under Minnesota's foodie, food cottage, cottage food law. And we've sold uh, uh, primarily at a, a kind of a regional food event in Rochester, Minnesota called Feast and uh, which has done, we've done really well. And this was prior to COVID, of course, um, uh, but uh, you see people could uh, taste all the different flavors and uh, we sold a lot. We also 
uh, have hosted a number of different field days. And I think when you're doing unusual fruits, that's a, a good strategy just to educate people on what you're doing, what these fruits are, and uh, what steps you're taking you know, to be certified organic and how you're providing habitat for pollinators and uh, uh, beneficial insects. So we also grow native plant species um, and uh, harvest the seed from those. Hand harvested in the fall after the fruit are done. And then we, we're right next door to Prairie Moon Nursery. So we um, sell on consignment through Prairie Moon. So in the foreground, you see butterfly weed, then New Jersey tea. We've now planted Harry Mountain mint between each of the uh, row, each of the plum trees. This is the New Jersey tea as it's getting close to harvest. Um, here's butterfly weed, flowers, and then the pods. It's a milkweed, so it attracts the uh, monarch butterfly larva. Here's one just forming the chrysalis on the uh, butterfly weed here. We also leave uh, milkweed, the common milkweed, which also is a food source for the monarch caterpillars. And we grow uh, Anna's hyssop, which the uh, uh, pollinators, the wild bumble bumblebees especially just love. And uh, here is showy goldenrod. You can see just covered with uh, bumblebees and then also some other kinds of uh, beetles, it looks like. We are certified organic by MOSA, and we participate in Minnesota Grown's uh, program and put their organic logo on our products. But we're also very proud to be part of the Real Organic Project, which is a no-cost add-on certification for farmers that are growing their crops in the soil and for livestock producers who actually provide pasture to their dairy cows, for instance. Um, but that really follow the organic law and the regulations. Um, some re resources I just want to mention, a couple books by Lee Reich, Uncommon Fruits for Every Garden and Grow Fruit Naturally. Um, those were very useful in learning some basic information about some of these fruits. There is an Organic Fruit Growers Association um, that we are part of. I mentioned earlier honeyberryusa.com. They sell more than just honeyberry plants. They sell other kinds of northern hardy fruit varieties and are happy to answer questions you might have. And then we have a lot of information about growing methods on our website, bluefruitfarm.com. And then finally, um, just a couple of years ago, University of Minnesota put out a new publication, uh, Perennial Fruit, New Unusual and Unique Crops for Northern Climates. And that's free. You can download it from the uh, MISA website there at the University of Minnesota. Uh, but, you know, it has general information, uh, but there's nothing like hands-on experience to really uh, learn what works and what doesn't work on your piece of this earth. So thanks for your time. Sorry about the uh, problems with the beginning. At least we got it to work. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, we do, we have quite a few questions, so um, I can start going through those. Um, there was a, a, a question around blueberries. Um, do you have a sense of the yields that you need to get for them to be profitable? Well, uh, around six pounds per plant. Uh, six, you know, they, they, the, the literature will say, you know, can yield eight to 10. Um, but uh, if we're getting six and we're har hand harvesting, we always figure that um, about half of the price that we charge to people is actually goes to the hand harvesters, to the harvest crew. Uh, so the rest of it is quote unquote profit, but that pays for... <laughs> The planting of the plants and everything is taken to get those plants, as well as taxes and everything else. Um, but we we like to see people harvesting, um, you know, around four pounds per hour. Um, uh, so um, anyway, yeah, a, a yield of six, and we sell our blueberries at eight dollars a pound. 
uh, that's the highest retail price. We charge less if people are doing a U pick or if we're selling, you know, 20 pounds or more to somebody. But if you're getting, you know, eight dollars a pound and six pounds per bush, that's forty-eight dollars your per bush, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, that seems to pencil out. Okay. And uh, you had mentioned that three-year potted blueberries did better than one-year bare root. Has that has that continued through to present day, or have they recovered? And no, no, no. Yeah, those those bushes. Um, we we had three rows, the shortest rows, unfortunately, but three rows that we initially planted as three-year-old potted bush plants, and the rest of that particular field. So about eighteen more rows we're all one year old rootstock. The ones that we put in from potted plants are still by far much, I mean, they're big bushes now. Um, whereas the others, they're catching up. You know, they're nice marketable yields, but not, you know, they might be more like three or four pounds where the others are in that eight pound, eight to 10 pound range. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's continued. Okay. Eventually they'll catch up. I mean, a blueberry bush, its lifespan is 50 years or so, so. And then there was a question around um, pastured poultry. Do you, do you think um, poultry are compatible with your system? Mm. We haven't tried that. So I, I, I really don't know. It would be problematic um, on kind of a five acre scale. I could certainly see having 20 or 30 backyard blueberry bushes and having poultry under them at certain times of year. But blueberries, like I said, are shallow rooted and chickens like to scratch and peck at the soil. So there easily could be some problems with them exposing roots and they dry out. And so you'll get some damage to the blueberry bushes. So I, I think it could be done but I'd be very careful about when the chickens were in the blueberry yard. I think they'll do better. And I've seen people successfully do chickens under brambles. So under uh, uh, raspberries or blackberries, they seem to not be as particular about, uh, you know, um, damage or uh, uh, any, kind of uh, uh, change to the soil. Uh, raspberries, I think, can take more disturbance at the soil level than blueberries would. Okay. And then there are a few questions around elderberries. So someone asked, um, how do you plant the elderberry transplants? And I think they might be getting at your comments around the crown. Sure. And... Yeah, well, I uh, start from the, you know, just the stem cut off that chunk of stem like I showed in the picture, and that goes into really moistened peat moss with vermiculite or perlite in it in some kind of a tub that has drainage. Um, but you wanna keep it moist and you stick them in so the bottom node is under the soil and that top node is right at the soil surface or the peat moss surface. And then um, keep it covered, keep it moist, it can and in a warm spot. And once they start to emerge the uh, uh, leaves, then you and you want to keep it vented so you don't get mold or mildew growing on the surface of the peat. Uh, so there needs to be vented, but also keeping high humidity. And then you need to put a grow light or have it in a sun, you know, a good sunny window or a greenhouse or something. Uh, one, so they can photosynthesize, and that really is going to help the roots develop. And I would then leave them in that main pot with a whole bunch of other uh, sprouting plants until the uh, uh, leaves are probably four to six inches tall, and that and they've got a good root development. Then we would have a mixture of potting soil. So something with compost, some nutrients in it, and uh, also some peat and vermiculite. Um, but put each 
individual plant. You break them up out of that uh, larger container and then um, pot them individually, keep them either in a sunny spot or a greenhouse, keep them moist. They need good moisture to keep those roots developing and from drying out and then let them just grow and grow. And you might even need to uh, water them with a fish emulsion or some kind of a fertilizer. And then once the danger of frost has passed, so you know mid-May or so, um, then you can put them out in the field. But if you get a late frost, be prepared to go out there and cover them because they're, they've been pampered. And even though the elderberries that are already in the field are starting to leaf out, those are going to be hardy to the frost, whereas um, the ones you put out are much more tender. So uh, protect them and then make sure and keep them watered uh, during that first growing season. Okay, and uh, there is a question. Can you cut elderberries back now or is it too late? Um, it, it's pushing it, uh, but no, you can cut them back now, but it might decrease your yield or their vig vigor uh, this year. Um, but you still, if you wanna make cuttings, you definitely can still cut those stems, divide them up into smaller chunks and propagate. It's not too late for that, but it may, if you cut them all down, it may stunt your production for this year, but it's not going to harm the plant over the long term. It just may, it may make them a little late in flowering and setting fruit this year. Okay. Um, and then someone had a question about honeyberries. They wondered um, if you could describe the taste, maybe in reference to- Yeah, sure. Here. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, I compare them to a slightly underripe blueberry. It still has good flavor, but they're tart. And the honeyberry has a certain tartness to it. And here's a really important thing about honeyberry harvest. Um, they'll turn blue and you eat them and they're like, mm, that's, that's a little too tart. Well, give them a week to two weeks from when they first turn blue. They sweeten up tremendously. And they also um, break free of the stem. If you pick them too early, the stem will come with them. If you wait until they're fully ripe, it's gonna uh, uh, separate from that little stem a lot easier. And I should also say, uh, we originally, we planted a number of different varieties of honeyberries. We planted two. The bushes were very vigorous. They were quite productive, but they were inedible. They were so bitter that I don't know if you've ever tasted honeysuckle berries, those red berries on the honeysuckle bush that's so invasive. They're just really bitter. And these were so bitter that we tried making jam of them. So added a lot of sugar. We still couldn't even eat the jam. So guess what? I had to use the tractor because they had to develop such a root system, but we pulled them up. But luckily it was only four of each variety. And those names are Midnight Blue and Night Mist. So I would avoid them like the plague. They're terrible. But the other varieties we grow, especially the, the tundra as a smaller berry, they're the earliest ripening, have wonderful flavor. Then the Aurora and Cinderella are nice, large size, um, but, and also just great flavor. You can just eat them right off the bush as you pick, as long as they're fully ripe. Okay, and this uh, I think is a more general question um, around how you prep your beds for planting. Ah, yeah, well, um, the preferred way to do it, which we did in years two and year three, um, was we did multiple crops of cover crops, of green manures. So we did sorghum Sudan grass and tilled that under, buckwheat tilled that under. Various clovers, work that under. Um, oats, the whole straw, everything, work that under. Um, so 
uh, the more cover cropping you can do to build the soil organic matter and also just the loftiness of the soil, I think is, is the best. But otherwise, um, working in lots of good quality compost and then amending the soil if you're planting blueberries so that your pH matches up with the needs. Uh, but all the other fruits we grow are fine with the pH in the range of 6.8, uh, which is our native pH. And I, I know there's interest in elderberries and I thought I had slides of uh, showing this, but I, I didn't. And there's a couple other problems we have with elderberries. One is called elderberry rust, where there are these yellow banana-like growths uh, the stem actually swells and kind of gets curved. And then you'll see spots of yellow on the leaves and stem. And that happens when the weather gets really hot and, and um, humid in late June, early July. And uh, what we do for that is just go through with uh, latex gloves and a garbage bag about once a week and just walk the rows and physically remove any infected stems or leaves. That's it. And that's been quite adequate. And we do that over about a three week period and that's it. Um, so that seems better than spraying. Um, we also do have two problems though that we spray for. And that is there's, a, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but erythrid mite that causes the leaves to curl and the fruit clusters to be deformed and really uh, not produce. And then we have some uh, issues with powdery mildew, not in the Bob Gordons, but in uh, the, some of the ranch and um, some of the uh, older York plants, um, I guess, and John's. And um, uh, what we do there is, Luckily, one product works for both the mites and the powdery mildew, and that's called Stylet Oil. It's approved for organic use. It's a very highly refined paraffin oil, and you mix it in water, cold water, in the sprayer tank, and um, spray the elderberry plants uh, with that. And that has been very effective at suppressing both the mites and the powdery mildew. And then if we do see powdery mildew getting close to harvest when the, when the clusters are full of green berries, um, then we will do a mixture of organic milk and it can be skim milk or whole milk, doesn't matter. 10 to one of water to milk and spray that on the elderberries. And that also uh, really suppresses the powdery mildew uh, closer to harvest. So just wanted to mention those kind of tricks that we've come up with. Okay. Um, can you share your source for bird netting? Oh, Owesco, I believe the name is of the company. Um, I think it's out of Maine. There's a lot of bird netting used in the Pacific Northwest. So in British Columbia, Washington and Oregon in big blueberry fields. Um, and it was SmartNet is, was the brand name, but the supplier was a company out of Maine called Owesco, O-W-E-S-C-O. And I'm going off memory and that's always a dangerous thing. <laughs> do, you, uh, do birds ever get caught in the nets? Oh yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Um, and yeah, typically we will open the net at one end of the field if there are birds inside the netting. Um, it's really hard to keep it totally closed and bird free. And robins will get down on the ground and hop along and find a little hole and jump through. So we'll open it at one end and do a little roundup and chase them out. What really hurts me is when I see um, dragonflies that have gotten caught in the net. I love dragonflies. They're an incredible insect and a voracious predator. And we have a lot of dragonflies come through our farm. And I just hate to see when they get caught in the netting and die. And then sometimes we'll see like, you know, a monarch butterfly or a luna moth or 
cecropia moth or something that got caught. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's not, uh, there's a lot of things that like fruit. And so, uh, you know, it's not just humans. Um, there's a question. Uh, how do you use your Wilsey weeder in the mulch? Yeah, we don't. Uh, where we have the fabric mulch, we're not using the weeder. But we have about 20, some 21, 22 rows of blueberries and then a couple rows of aronia where we previously had either pine straw or bark mulch. But over time that has deteriorated and become valuable organic matter. And so instead of trying to put really thick mulch, which can cause some issues, we decided to go with the mechanical weeder and then do cover cropping with the green manure crops, like I mentioned. So it's not just exposed soil. It's exposed for a while, but we come back um, and, and plant a cover crop seed. Um, so I think we're probably uh, getting a net increase in uh, soil carbon, even though we're using some tillage. Uh, but yeah, where we have the uh, fabric, uh, I have mixed feelings about that. It's, it's a lot less weed pressure, but I think it also, um, the plants aren't quite as vigorous and you can't work in the compost. Whereas where we are using mechanical weeder, we can, we make really good compost. We give a good uh, top dressing of compost and then the weeder, we come through and that stirs it into the upper soil surface. And even though blueberries have shallow roots, we've kind of trained them that that upper level of soil is ours. And we're going to, you know, um, uh, be stirring it around every once in a while. And uh, the plants actually have not got, they've responded favorably to the mechanical weeding. Those, those bushes are much more vigorous. Um, and part of it's a combination of, you know, better weed control, but also just releasing more nutrients and then being able to add more compost. Okay, I think our last question here is, can you spell the name of the spray for powdery mildew? Oh, Stylet, S-T-Y-L-E-T, -E oil. Uh, I think JMS is a brand name on it. We have gotten it from Ag uh, Resource in Minnesota. And they often have a booth like at the Moses Conference, Ag Resource, JMS Stylet Oil. Okay. I didn't know there's going to be a spelling bee. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are at 1.30 and uh, I think that was all the questions. So that was great. I really, I think we had 64 people. Um, wow. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, good luck. Uh, <laughs> enjoy. Happy spring.